I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Spotify versus Apple, the music streamer, calls for the EU to investigate the iPhone maker over how it treats rival music streaming services, saying it has created an untenable situation with ever-chasing rules and a massive tax. Plus, Google Power struggle, new court documents, so co-founder Larry Page worried he would lose control of the company in 2011 and delivered what one director called a veiled threat to quit. And both sides of the aisle are taking up the issue of breaking up big tech, but breaking up is hard to do. We will talk to Elevation Partners' Roger McNamee about Washington's new tech agenda. But first to our top story, Spotify is taking on Apple. In a new complaint, the music streaming service argues Apple should be probed by EU antitrust regulators over how it allegedly squeezes rival music services by taking a cut of all sales on its app store. KeyBank says Spotify is largely on the right side of the complaint and any big change to payment terms could affect Apple's earnings and cash flow. To discuss, I want to bring in Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners and author of Zucked. Also with us, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who covers Apple for us. So Mark, what exactly is Spotify arguing in this complaint? Spotify is arguing that Apple, as the platform owner of the App Store, the iPhone and the iPad, but also the developer of a competing streaming music service in Apple Music, is giving Apple Music a leg up over Spotify. And Spotify is claiming that's unfair. So does Spotify make a point, a good point here? You know, Spotify makes a, a great point here, whereas Apple is playing both sides of the coin. But I find it sort of obvious that Apple, as a organization of business, is going to promote, you know, Apple Music. But one of Spotify's points is that Apple takes 30% cuts from subscription apps for apps that only compete with its own services, but that's not really the case. Apple takes that 30% cut for the first year and 15% cut for the second year for all subscription apps. And what you've seen lately are apps, including Spotify as well as Netflix, sort of working around that 30% cut by making sure users can't subscribe to their services via the iPhone. They have to subscribe via a website or another platform and log into those apps. What you're also seeing increasingly are app developers raising their prices for subscription apps exclusively for iPhone users in order to take back that tax of 30%. So Roger, how worthy would you sp say Spotify's argument is here? Well, I think the argument, as Mark said, is way less clear cut than people would have you believe. In the United States, there's a case that is working its way through the courts called Pepper that's on this exact issue relative to the, to the App Store. And Apple's situation from an antitrust perspective, I think, is going to be hard to defend because at the end of the day, the issues that we worry about with other monopolists uh, come to bear here, which is this notion of being a market maker and at the same time, being the owner of one of the participants in the market. And I do think Apple is going to have to work very, very hard to justify this. What I think makes people sympathetic towards Apple is that the App Store has actually been one of the ways that Apple has protected its customers from the predatory surveillance of products like Google and Facebook. And they've done a really good job of that. So at some fundamental level, the App Store is one of the good guys but in this particular case, Spotify, you know, is making a point about participating in the market. The reality is the economic argument Spotify is making is way less uh, sound than they want us to believe. But I do think the antitrust argument has some weight. Interesting. M Mark, how is Apple responding so far? You know, so far, Apple hasn't said anything on this issue. But one thing I've been thinking about is I really don't think that this is something Apple put much consideration into while developing Apple Music. Since the beginning of the App Store, Apple has sold its own applications. I mean, I think this is a similar argument to, you know, Apple not being allowed to sell its own products at the Apple Store because there's hundreds of them uh, around the world. I don't see why Apple shouldn't be allowed to sell their own applications through the store. 
What I do somewhat agree with on the Spotify side is that they could still level the playing field. Right now, only Apple applications can be set as default. So the default music player on the iPhone is obviously Apple Music. Uh, the default email app is not Gmail's app, it's Apple's app. So if Apple added a toggle where you could make any third-party app uh, an equal citizen on its platform, that could go a long way to pushing back against an antitrust issue. Roger, I'm sensing that you agree. I think in general I do, but again, I'm incredibly sympathetic to Apple's position. I can't make a good intellectual argument for it because I do think that the my basic belief in antitrust is people should not make markets and participate in them. And I'm not at all sympathetic to Spotify because I think Spotify has done tremendous harm to musicians and copyright owners in the music business. So this is a difficult thing for me emotionally to look at. What I would say... Right, you're a musician yourself. Exactly. So I have no sympathy for Spotify. And so I look at this situation and I think that from an investor's point of view, though, you have to recognize that in the European Union, the, in, the uh, antitrust case is going to be decided on the merits of their antitrust law. And I think, as Mark suggested, it's... It, the, the antitrust case is pretty solid here. I think the really interesting question from Apple's perspective is, you know, if they were faced with the choice, would they be willing to either shut down Apple Music or manage it a different way in order to continue to have the same basic business model of the App Store? Because they clearly, Apple Music is clearly not important enough to Apple to justify, uh, you know, losing the App Store and its current levels of control. That said, uh, Tim Cook is, you know, has touted the services business as, you know, becoming well, a much bigger part of Apple's business. But, but Emily, and Apple Music is a critical part of that. But Emily, I think that's looking at it too narrowly. I think Apple's big business opportunity is to go and take the hardware business and make that a subscription, so that you no longer buy an iPhone for a thousand dollars. You pay something per month and you get a bundle of services with the base case and then you can pay more for more services. And in that context, Apple Music looks different than it looks today and its relative weight in that bundle is going to be different. And I just, I look at this thing and I want to step back. If I'm Apple, I think you have to look at Apple Music and ask, is this as core going forward as it might have been a couple of years ago when the market was still growing? And I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. Meantime, Mark, uh, Apple is holding an event in a couple of weeks, March 25th, where it's going to unveil its streaming and original content strategy. We hear there might be celebrities at this event. What are you expecting? Right. So, I mean, just as part of this, this is an interesting backdrop to the Spotify situation because Apple's really going to announce itself as a services company on Monday, March 25th, like you said, by introducing their competitor to Netflix, their magazine subscription service, and they might discuss their new credit card strategy that they're teaming up on with Goldman Sachs. Uh, later this year. So I'm expecting that and all sorts of, of services discussion. And I agree with Roger's point about Apple sort of shifting its hardware to a subscription model. But just one more thing on Spotify. You know, Spotify put out this website and it has a list of five issues it takes with Apple. I think the simplest fix here is Apple could basically just work with Spotify and mitigate those five things yeah. that Spotify is complaining about. They're asking for better access to the Apple Watch. Apple could do that. They're, act, they're asking to be able to write an app for the HomePod. Apple could allow that. They're asking for some special concessions regarding percentage splits on the App Store. They're asking for the ability for easier upgrades in the App Store. You know, Apple has their annual developers conference in the beginning of June, just a few months away. And I'd be surprised if Apple wasn't already planning some of these things that would mitigate the problem from Spotify's perspective, as well as the perspective from other outside app developers, smaller ones that don't get as much attention as Spotify because they don't have their, their user base. All right. Well, we are going to have full coverage of that event on March 25th right here on Bloomberg, Bloomberg Mark, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Thank you so much for joining us. Elevation Partners co-founder Roger McNamee, you are sticking with me. Much more to discuss. What? Meantime, users of Facebook as well as Instagram and Facebook Messenger around the globe experienced outages throughout the day on Wednesday. A Facebook spokesperson released this statement saying, we are aware that some people are currently having trouble accessing the Facebook family of apps. We're working to resolve the issue as soon as possible. Coming up, breaking up big tech, we are going to break down U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren's ambitious plan as she campaigns for president, taking aim at the power of Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon. I want to hear what Roger McNamee has to say about that. And 
And once upon a time, South by Southwest, that is where it all went down. This was a huge tech festival, but now it is a place where ambitious politicians come to gather. We will discuss. This is Bloomberg. Longtime tech and music festival South by Southwest turned into a buzzy campaign stop for the 2020 U.S. presidential candidates. At one event, Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts promised legislation that could break up Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Senator Warren says big tech companies have too much power over our economy, our society, our democracy. At another event, Senator Amy Klobuchar declared that she wants to make antitrust cool again, a clear swipe at the same company. So. What would a big tech breakup look like? Still with us, Roger McNamee of Elevation Partners and author of Zucked. Roger, I've been dying to hear what you think about this proposal. Um, what do you think about the plan Warren laid out in, in fairly decent detail? So I really like what Elizabeth Warren is doing. To be clear, I, she first reached out to Tristan Harris and me back in the summer of 2017 with her early thoughts relative to what was going on in technology. And I was incredibly impressed by the insights that she had in comparing what was wrong in tech to what she'd seen go wrong in the banking business, where essentially you had markets in which one side had vastly superior information and was able to control the information available to the other side, and where people who made markets were also participating in them. And so when this thing came out, I, you know, I've studied it very closely. And I believe antitrust is essential in two different ways. First is the big tech companies, really I'm talking about Google, Facebook, Amazon, are blocking competition from startups in their immediate area. They're basically causing innovation to come to a stall in, in, in and around the core internet. And They've been amazingly successful at this, and I just think that's a terrible idea. I want to end that, and Warren is very much on that issue. And antitrust, it's a super pro-growth way of doing that. Historically in tech, starting in 56 with the AT&T consent decree through IBM, the second AT&T breakup case, Microsoft, you've seen massive new industries created by using antitrust to stop the incumbent from dominating new spaces. So I like that. I also like the notion of preventing companies, the, the topic we were just talking about relative to Apple, companies that operate markets from also participating. Google and Facebook do this in advertising. Amazon does this in its marketplace. And I just think that should stop. I think the cross subsidies uh, and cross sharing of data are also really, really bad. And I believe that Warren's proposal is a first step down that and I'm very supportive. I recognize the people who point out that the history of tech, you know, was misinterpreted in some of the, the statements that came out there. I really couldn't care less. And the reason I couldn't care less is because I think the issues in tech, the power situation, the dominance of the public square, the uh, manipulative technologies that people are using, the surveillance that is now pervasive in our lives, that's just bad for society and we should not allow that. That the new, no. te new tech companies are a little bit like the, the uh, they're kind of like the companies of the early 20th century, you know, the robber barons, so Standard Oil and, and J.P. Morgan and all. I should point out, Roger, that there's no real breakup threat under today's laws and under antitrust Precedent. So well, a lot to of be things clear, would I have don't to change. A lot of lawmakers would have to get on side. Do you see a better argument to break up Facebook or Google or Amazon or Apple? You know, which one of those four companies do you think yeah, let, you know, let, presents the best case that serves Elizabeth Warren's argument? Let, let us be clear, right? This is a position. There's no guarantee we finish there. But you want to start with a position that says we're going to do something really dramatic. We may be open to finishing somewhere else. And this is where I agree with both Senator Warren and Senator Klobuchar. And I think both of these two really understand this issue. And, you know, whether you break them up or not is less important to me than you prevent them from operating in ways that stall the economy, which is what we've got going on right now. I think you can achieve some of this without breaking them up. 
But the threat of breaking them up is the way you get them to the table to have the conversation that we need to have. And I just want to be super clear about something. I'm really excited about the strides we've seen in the Trump administration, particularly in the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. In my own conversations with them, what I've found is that these are people who understand that there is something really wrong with what's going on in tech right now and that antitrust is the most pro-growth way of dealing with that and they are the antitrust tools in the regulatory toolbox. And both of them are, are doing things right now that are a big, big change from what we've seen in antitrust under the Obama administration or before them in the Bush administration. So I look okay. at this and I think this is, I don't think this is gonna be partisan. I think this is a right versus wrong issue, not a right versus left issue. That said, Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, these are four different companies. Yes, they're all tech companies. Yes, there are some overlapping businesses, yeah. but do you think any one of these is, is more a, a sort of culprit or a target than another? Well, I think Google is by far the most effective at this, right? They, they had this insight in 2002 that, you know, when they were trying to improve search, they would gather all this data and they discovered they only need about one or two percent of it to improve search. So they went looking for what they could do with the other 98 percent and they discovered they could use it to predict behavior. So then they go in and they do Gmail because they want to find out who these people are. And with Gmail, they set up so they, they could machine read all the emails, which would tell them what people's behavior was going to be because people would tell you an email. And then they wanted to know where they were, so they created Google Maps. And then they start things like Street View where they drive up and down the streets taking pictures of everybody's private spaces. And then you know they do the satellite version of that. And then they do Google Glass. And now you've got Google Home, right? So you, you're putting audio into everybody's houses. And they're basically taking away all of our privacy, where privacy is defined as our ability to make choices without fear and without being exposed by others. But they're also taking away our pricing power because they manage our access to information just as they manage the access of anybody who has something to sell. They manage their access to consumers. And essentially, they're centralizing the whole economy in the hands of Google, number one, then Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and Verizon. They're the five guys who are at the core of that strategy. And let's face it, it's a brilliant strategy. I just think we need to have a conversation as a country. Why is it legal for corporations to, to own and trade our most private data? Why are they allowed to buy and sell and trade our credit card transaction data, which they get from you know, Experian and Equifax and TransUnion? Why are cellular companies allowed to sell our location? Why are health and wellness apps allowed to sell data that if it were a hospital, they wouldn't be able to sell? Why you know, are any internet companies allowed to sell our, trans, you know, our, our passage history, you know, our search history does, online. Does Apple stand out to you from the rest because oh, you know, I, of their Apple stance clearly, on privacy? Apple's not perfect, right? A lot of what they do in China I object to, but what they're doing in this area, I think they're fantastic. And so the reason why I have mixed feelings and I'm not actually, I'm kind of hoping that there's a way for them to avoid the antitrust problem is because I think Apple is trying to be a good guy and they've really succeeded. I mean, the iPhone, actually does protect your privacy and your security in ways that Google's Android phones, which is pretty much everybody else, does not. And, you know, I want to reward Apple for doing all that stuff. So I don't tar them with the same brush, even though there are clearly areas okay. where they're vulnerable. And, you know, the Spotify case would be one of them. Roger, we could spend hours talking about this, Next debating time. this. Always appreciate uh, having you here. Thanks for coming in on your busy book tour. Roger McNamee, founder of Elevation Partners and author of Zucked. Always appreciate you stopping by. Coming up, President Trump says the U.S. is grounding the Boeing 737 MAX. We're going to cover the new and massive development following the model's second crash in five months. This is Bloomberg. In a sudden reversal, President Trump announced the FAA will ground Boeing 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9 planes. Here's what he had to say earlier from the White House. Uh, we're going to be issuing an emergency order of prohibition to ground all flights of the 737 MAX 8 
and the 737 MAX 9 and planes associated with that line. Brooke Sutherland covers the industrial sector with Bloomberg Opinion and joins us now from New York. So, Brooke, the FAA is saying they gathered unspecified evidence at the site. What exactly do, do we know, if anything, about this evidence? We still don't know very much at this point as far as what the new data is that would, you know, convince the FAA to reconsider its position on this Boeing 737 MAX jet. We did hear from Canada earlier today that said there was new surveillance data from the crash that was inconclusive but suggested that there was a connection to the earlier crash in October on that Lion Air flight. And that was what gave Canada reason to say, we're going to put the brakes on this just out of an abundance of caution. We're going to ground these planes. And so President Trump did say that the U.S. was working closely with Canada. So it may be that they're talking about the same surveillance data and just different interpretations of it. Now, American Southwest fly the MAX 8. United flies the MAX 9. Why is the MAX 9 included here? I think it's just sort of a blanket ban on the entire family, but the MAX 9 has not had any crashes associated with it, and it is a slightly different model. So it is interesting to see them including that in this. I think perhaps the FAA is playing a little bit of catch up here, having been rather late to the game as far as grounding these planes and trying to demonstrate a concern for the safety of the passengers that arguably it was rather reluctant to demonstrate earlier uh, when it kept insisting confidence in the plane, even as regulators around the world took more aggressive action. Now, what are we hearing from Boeing? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the software update that was basically ordered after the first crash, but didn't roll out until after this crash. So it took several months. I mean, is there any explanation for that when you're talking about a life and death issue? Right. Well, so the software app update is actually not in place yet. They're expected to have that by April, so they're working on it. Um, you know, I think Boeing's communication has really not been great here, and I have a call on that this afternoon just saying it's a little ironic that Boeing is now calling the FAA's grounding of the planes proactive because it is anything but proactive. Uh, you know, they're really rather late to the party here where you have almost every other regulator has already grounded the planes, and I really think Boeing had an opportunity to get out in front of this, to take control of the narrative, and to ask the FAA to ground these planes from the get-go. I mean, whatever, we still don't know exactly what happened in the Ethiopian Airlines crash. But regardless of that, you had two airplane crashes at a time when that's really relatively rare, and you had over 340 people that passed away. I mean, I think that's just very serious. And then it calls for conservatism as we try to figure this out. Right. And just to remind everyone, we still don't know the actual cause of this second crash. We still don't know exactly you know, whether it's connected to the first crash, and that is what investigators are trying to find out. Bloomberg's Brooke Sutherland, thank you so much for that update. Coming up, Larry Page's quest for power. We're going to look at how he has fought to make sure he does not lose control of Google. And later in the show, Elon Musk versus the whistleblower. How Tesla's CEO hit back after someone leaked that Tesla's Gigafactory wasn't running efficiently. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Nearly 21 years ago, Larry Page and Sergey Brin founded a small search engine that we all now know as the behemoth Google. Since then, it's become one of the largest public tech companies in the world with a market value of more than $830 billion. And with any company becoming public comes the threat of founders losing control, something that a board member described as a, quote, real concern to co-founder Page. In fact, according to confidential emails and other documents recently unsealed in a court case, we know how badly Page wanted to keep his grip on his creation. Why should I sacrifice and work so hard if I might not be in control? That is what Page allegedly told former Google director Paul Odellini. To discuss, in New York, we've got Lawrence Cunningham, professor at George Washington Law School, where he specializes in corporate governance. And here with me in the studio, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Bergen, who, of course, covers Alphabet and got this big scoop. So Odellini actually described what Page said here as a veiled threat to quit. And what's interesting is it's also the first time we've seen any sort of division between the, Google's found the Google founders, because why Page wanted this is because he was concerned about what Sergey Brin would do with his shares. So 
explain exactly what happened here. Yeah, that was the that was what he expressed to the board. I mean, it's, in these court documents, we don't really have Larry speaking at all. Um, there is a deposition from Sergey, his co-founder. But around this time, Larry had just returned. Page had just returned as CEO. So he was CEO at the beginning. Right, the board brought on Eric Schmidt as a sort of adult supervision. He comes back. He goes to visit Steve Jobs that year. Asks him, you know, what does it take to be a good CEO? Um, he goes reads all the books about good, good CEO, and he's trying to pivot the company in, in a big direction. Sergey, meanwhile, is going into Google X, so this is the beginning of self-driving cars, the early days of Google Glass. Um, we, you know, we talked to people involved then uh, that had said there was always tension between the two, but it's always sort of a healthy tension. What these documents show is that at times it maybe wasn't, and, and Larry was concerned that either um, Sergey or Eric would sell their shares, perhaps leave the company, and then uh, an outside group would, would have a controlling stake. Eric, Eric Schmidt. So what the founders wanted was the creation of a new class of shares, mm -hmm. of non-voting shares. They already had these Class B shares, right, with 10 votes per share that Larry, Sergey, and Eric had. And votes for regular shareholders, uh, sh shares for regular shareholders that had one vote. Right. Right? And the, and the initial plan, they said, um, I think it was December, around Christmas, they're like, we'll get this done in three weeks. Uh, and the board actually pushed back for over a year, and there was this back and forth, uh, and this lawsuit actually sh demonstrated there was a much bigger pushback than, than what a lot of people knew. Odalini expressed concern about Page's threat, and the board ultimately created a committee to, to, just, to, to look into whether these shares should be granted. Um, Larry, what do you make of how Google's board handled this situation? I'm impressed by how the board handles this situation, pushing back against stockholders who have a controlling stake thanks to a dual class structure is, is not easy. So I was, I was impressed that they, they, they pushed and, and insisted uh, that Larry explain exactly what he was up to. I mean, after all, if he was merely concerned about ordinary dilution, they could just avoid issuing stock. They could use cash for acquisitions or they could purchase stock back. So they pushed hard on him and he essentially admitted that his main concern seemed to be that if, if uh, Sergey Brin were to uh, sell his stock, then uh, Larry would lose the joint majority control, and uh, he was very concerned about that. And issuing the the C uh, no vote stock would would solve that problem. If he he could trade his C to uh, to Sergey for for the B and can retain control. So I think the board uncovered that and did a good job. Now, Mark, the board still decided to start this new class of right. no voting shares. Why, despite this concerns? Right, uh, we saw John Doerr is a good example, the, the legendary uh, VC here in Silicon Valley. He's been a board member for a long time. He originally was against the proposal. Um, there was one of the depositions that said that he changed his mind. Uh, in part, he was convinced that this was the best way to recruit talent, right? This is a huge concern at Google and has been historically about recruiting the best, most talented engineers. I think a so lot- keeping. Bryn and Page engaged Clearly. would help recruit talent. Yeah, and then and this is about the time you know they're they're about this this year they make the biggest 12.5 billion dollar acquisition of Motorola. Um, Page has these big plans that that he's come see to fruition right of Alphabet of self-driving cars of biotech of healthcare all this stuff that was didn't exist at Google in 2011 and now these uh, much grander you know, moonshots and and. Um, areas and moving to different fields that arguably couldn't have happened if the founders uh, didn't have such tight control of the company. Meantime, when you give founders this much power, there's always the risk of them perhaps making not great decisions. And Larry, we've been covering another story out of Google where Page himself personally approved a $150 million payout package for Andy Rubin, the creator of Android, who was accused of sexual harassment. and permitted this guy to leave the company quietly and then invested in his next company, also paid another uh, Google executive, Amit Singhal, $45 million, also accused of sexual misconduct. Where was the board then? Well, if true, both of these examples show the downside to dual class. I mean, the, the proponents of dual class argue that the founders' vision and their long-term uh, outlook uh, warrant that kind of control. But here, uh, to the extent that the uh, and the downside is, is that you sacrifice some uh, accountability to shareholders. If it's true that, and I think it's disputed by the company and, and by the uh, executive who was leaving, uh, that uh, the CEO or the founding shareholder is able unilaterally to make that kind of decision. That's uh, a, a downside to dual class. And I mean, I can't say the board has a lot of uh, a lot of power in, in a situation like that, but it, it, it points up uh, some of the negatives and some problems of managerial accountability with with a dual class uh, stock. And you know, to the extent that uh, that uh, Sergey was just thinking about selling anyway and. 
Uh, Larry is, is sort of faded a little bit into the background of running the company. It's not so obvious what their vision and, and their sense of the long-term interests of Google and the other stockholders is that, that warrants having uh, the disproportionate control. Well, Andy Rubin did ultimately leave with $90 million. The board did rubber stamp that. But other tech companies have, you know, emulated this dual class model. Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg, where he has a lot of control. Snap with Evan Spiegel, where he has a lot of control. You've got some of these upcoming IPOs, the founders of these companies doing the very same thing. Is the dual class structure actually a good thing for shareholders and for the company? Yeah, you know, it's, it's only good when the founders do have that, that vision, that secret sauce, and that special outlook. And sometimes it can be very helpful. Uh, it's been used successfully in some of those tech companies. It was used by Nike uh, with Phil Knight. And, and so if the guy has the secret sauce, it's, it's helpful. But the downside is that you really have to trust the fellow and that he's got to be able to, to you know, remain accountable. And this episode suggests the downside to, to dual class. And people who, people who support it and are proponents do need to be careful that when we get some obnoxious behavior or pernicious behavior, you're going to get public backlash, backlash against dual class and regulatory authorities may begin to crack down. And I don't think that would be in anyone's interest because sometimes the device is, is useful and, and effective. So I think we ought to pre try to protect it. And uh, those who enjoy the benefits ought to you know, vindicate the trust that's being shown. All right, George Washington University's Lawrence Cunningham, thank you so much, as well as Bloomberg's Mark Bergen. Great scoop from you. Coming up, a whistleblower, a lawsuit, and reports of a fake shooter. What do they all have in common? Tesla's Gigafactory. Find out how. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now, it was back in June of 2018 that a Business Insider article detailed how inefficiency at Tesla's Gigafactory in Nevada cost the company around $150 million. That information came from a whistleblower that the electric car maker believed to be Martin Tripp, a former employee. But since then, the story has been one wild ride after another, featuring allegations of corporate espionage, a multi-million dollar lawsuit, a security guard also turned whistleblower, and a fake mass shooter report. In New York, to untangle it all for us, Bloomberg's Matt Robinson, who wrote about this in this week's upcoming edition of Bloomberg Business Week. And it is a tangled up story indeed, Matt. There are some new developments in that other Tesla employees have now spoken to the SEC and said that Tesla's response to the leaker, if you will, was out of proportion. What exactly happened here? That's right. Um, the, you know, Marty Tripp uh, came out. You know, there's a Business Insider uh, story out in the beginning of June. A few weeks later, uh, it was determined that Tripp was the, um, you know, who, who gave information to the reporter there. Um, our story uh, was reporting that the, the individual in charge or involved in the investigative figuring out who Tripp was says that, you know, they sort of went overboard in trying to figure out who he was, saying that, you know, sort of disputing some of the um, information from Tesla itself saying, you know, Tripp didn't actually sabotage or hack company systems. He did access certain parts of uh, the data, internal numbers, but sort of uh, beyond, you know, basically saying, making accusations they didn't really have the evidence for. Now, this security employee has told the SEC they hacked in Tesla, hacked into Tripp's phone, misled police, had him followed. Um, meantime, Tripp and Musk were engaged in you know, a heated email exchange, Tripp saying to Musk, you have what's coming to you for the lies you've told the public and investors. Musk responding, threatening me only makes it worse for you. You should be ashamed of yourself for framing other people. You're a horrible human being. Tripp responding, I never framed anyone else or even insinuated anyone else is being involved. Putting cars on the road with safety issues is being a horrible human being. How is Tesla explaining this? Because part of the allegations here is that the PR department itself actually spread... Perhaps you could call them rumors. We don't know for sure, um, but per, uh, unsubstantiated uh, statements. Right. So the actually, so Trip was fired on June nineteenth. News of the lawsuit. So Tesla sued Trip, alleging that he had sabotaged, you know, basically um, taking some valuable um, IP. And that exchange was that morning um, after that lawsuit um, 
came out. And then a few hours later, there was an anonymous tip placed to a Las Vegas call center at Tesla saying that Marty Tripp or a friend of uh, Marty Tripp saying who's distraught, potentially was going to have, you know, planning a, a sort of a sort of a shooting of some sort. So that tip was then relayed to the sheriff's office, who had to sort of chase him down and see, OK, is this really a credible threat? The sheriffs did make contact with Tripp. Um, you, you know, we sort of desc described some of the body cam footage. They found Tripp very distraught. He's crying. Um, and then he sits down and explains to the officers what had transpired. The sheriffs say, OK, well, we don't deem this a credible threat. We made contact. Uh, he doesn't seem dangerous. And, you know, and that's what they told Tesla. And then thereafter, uh, the next day, Tesla put out a statement about uh, a threat that the sheriff's department had, had deemed uh, you know, not to be credible. Now, in the meantime, Business Insider's reporting Elon Musk took issue with, and he responded specifically to one of the reporters, Lynette Lopez, uh, responding to one of her stories saying, sound very sketchy if, if true. Is it possible you're serving as an inside trading source for one of Tesla's biggest short sellers? An ex-Tesla employee just went on record formally claiming you bribed him and he sent you valuable Tesla IP in exchange. Is this true? Uh, she and Business Insider have denied this. Is there any evidence of some sort of broader conspiracy at work? Well, so the other, so the individual who was tasked with, you know, involved in trying to find Trip at this time uh, was, you know, involved in investigations. There's uh, Sean Guthrow, and he's uh, going on the record in our story saying that they never found evidence to, su to suggest that he took a bribe. Trip never uh, admitted taking a bribe. Um, there was no, you know, credible evidence to, to, excuse me, to substantiate some of those accusations. So what's next now with what these folks have told the SEC, you know, could the SEC actually take action here? So, you know, the, uh, you know, as, as we reported, you know, Tripp did talk to the SEC for a few hours last summer, sort of talking about how he accessed some, some of the numbers, the internal numbers. So, you know, the issues here involving the uh, police reports and the potential, you know, the, the sort of uh, phantom shooter threat. So the SEC is going to be concerned with the numbers, right? The, you know, what, what did Tesla say to you know investors and what did their numbers reflect internally and that's something that uh, the government takes a long time to investigate they never determine who called in that that's right, right correct right. right that's right they never they never determined who made the call to Las Vegas call center and uh, Tesla didn't make uh, the person involved who took the call uh, available either all right Bloomberg's Matt Robinson thank you so much for your reporting in this upcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week Still ahead, the Chinese e-commerce company Pinduoduo out with its fourth quarter results. How it's competing with rivals Alibaba and JD.com is next. Plus, Broadcom set to report first quarter results Thursday. But will the chip maker be affected by a slowing smartphone market? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Uber is ramping up for what could be one of the five biggest IPOs ever in the United States. Bloomers learned the ride-hailing service has added several banks to the list of underwriters, among them Bank of America, Barclays, Citigroup, and Allen & Company. Morgan Stanley is leading the Uber IPO along with Goldman Sachs. The company could be valued at as much as $120 billion. Well, the Chinese e-commerce company Pinduoduo reported fourth quarter results Wednesday. And while the Tencent-backed company beat revenue expectations, losses surged to $385 million. This as it spent heavily on advertising and technology to take on rivals Alibaba and JD.com. Joining us to discuss, James Mee, founding partner of Lightspeed China Partners, who is an investor in Pinduoduo. And you actually worked with the founder at Google China many, many years ago. Yeah. So... Talk to us about how Pinduoduo fits into the broader e-commerce landscape in China. Are they a real threat to Alibaba and JD? I think uh, Pinduoduo really addressed the market segments, really haven't really uh, served very well by Taobao or Alibaba or JD, which is uh, how to effectively find uh, merchants and a good price. And uh, the model they had leveraging the social network, and it's referred by the friends, and, uh, and the aggregate the demand from the consumer very quickly. So the supplier, the sellers, they can provide the merchant, uh, the products at a very f attractive price to users. And that model never has been worked, uh, uh, worked before. And uh, this is 
a company that really address that market. And so you see the biggest user demographics is a, a third tier, fourth tier city, which is really the driver for growth for mobile internet. The first tier, second tier city mobile internet user growth is slowing down. So this is a, a company that really has a lot of potential. Is there a, co a good comparison here in the United States? No, this is really an original innovation. My partners here at Lightspeed is always trying to figure out how we can make it work here in the U.S. So it would be like if there was a, you know, a new budding Amazon but popular in the middle of the country. That's right. And think about it. This is a company started three and a half years ago from ground up. Now it's a public Nasdaq company with 28 billion U.S. dollars. Why doesn't it work in the United States? I, I think there's a potential. And certainly there's a benefit for all the sellers uh, are in China. And, the, and you see, the, if you go to Walmart here, and a lot of products made, made in China, right? So the merchants are actually available. So when you build an e-commerce platform marketplace, it's easier to do that in China. Where do you think the biggest opportunities in the China tech scene are right now? I think there's continuous uh, consumer internet opportunities. But increasingly, we are seeing enterprise and deep tech actually is picking up. How is the trade war, the trade tension impacting your job? Um, surprisingly, we just raised our fourth fund at the beginning of the year, 516 million U.S. dollars. And uh, I was a little bit surprised that the biggest demand is from the top institution investors from U.S. Why do you think that is? I, I think people really realize that and also recognize China is becoming one of the largest venture investment markets. And the return in terms of the growth uh, for early stage particularly is very, very attractive. So you want to get into the top funds, you need to deploy that. Um, so that, that's it's a long-term investment and the people see that opportunity. Do you see the difficulty for U.S. investors to navigate China and the bureaucracy and the regulatory issues to change anytime soon? It certainly doesn't seem like the Chinese government is backing down. I think uh, uh, that's why they look for the top uh, VC managers and uh, in terms of investing these top internet companies or deep tech companies, actually we see the regulation is getting more relaxed. I think certainly to some degree there's a pressure from the U.S. side, right, on uh, China to open up the market even more and uh, what we're seeing that trend is actually more favorable for U.S. investors. You worked with Kai-Fu Lee at Google China and he seems to think that it's basically impossible for Google or Facebook or um, many U.S. tech companies, even Amazon perhaps, to succeed in China at this point, Would Airbnb even. Would you agree? Yeah, I tend to agree because I started at Google 2003. I was the first uh, chief representative for Google China rep office. And, uh, but if you look at all the internet companies from U.S., they have the mentality that it's working in the U.S. and it should work in China, but the market is very, very different. You look at the Pinduoduo, you never imagine something like that in the U.S. So, so they are not structured to compete with the local competitors. All right, Lightspeed China Partners, James Me. Good to have you here in the studio. Thank you for stopping Thank by. Thank you. Well, chipmaker Broadcom reports earnings after the bell Thursday. Analysts are forecasting first quarter revenues of $5.8 billion, up 9% from a year earlier. Despite high hopes for the company's outlook, the broader chip industry faces slowdowns in a number of key markets. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow explains. There's a good chance the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth chip in your smartphone is made by Broadcom. The $105 billion company sells them to both Apple and Samsung, and in fact Apple accounts for about 25% of the company's total revenue. That's why Broadcom is seen as a barometer for the health of the smartphone industry. Last quarter, Broadcom's wireless business performed better than expected with $1.7 billion of sales. On the earnings call, CEO Hock Tan talked about a North American customer who bought more chips than expected to put inside its older smartphone models. He didn't name the customer, but joined the dots. Even so, sales for Broadcom's wireless business still fell 5% from a year earlier, as the global smartphone market continues to slow down. Broadcom shares the white line really trailed the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, the blue line, from July through September of last year. But since November, Broadcom has outperformed the broader SOX index as the company weathered the slowdown in the global smartphone market. Now there's a new concern facing the industry. Chipmakers from NVIDIA to Intel are talking about slowing demand in another key market, 
data centers. What the chip makers are telling us is that they've actually ordered too much, that they've got ahead of their build plans, they've got too much inventory, and they need to work through that before they can return to ordering. In the past, Broadcom relied on robust sales of data center chips to offset weaker demand in smartphones. And while the company still expects demand from its cloud customers, analysts are concerned Broadcom will get distracted from its focus on chips. In December, Broadcom purchased software maker CA Technologies for $18 billion. Shares fell the most on record, and the deal left analysts scratching their heads over why Broadcom would shift its M&A strategy from hardware to software. But Bloomberg Intelligence still sees the CA deal being the main driver of sales growth and margins in 2019. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg News, San Francisco. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are, of course, live streaming on Twitter as always. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.